Hallelujah, praise the name of Jesus Christ. Good morning, brothers and sisters, friends and family. It's good to be here again sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Welcome to our Sunday ministration. It's an honor and a privilege to be here to be here again. My name is Pastor Femi Alara of Living in the World International Church, a place where we preach Christ undiluted and we receive the keys to fulfill our destinies. And I pray that your destiny shall be fulfilled in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're joining us for the very first time, we've been looking at a series of teaching this month, the wonders of God's word. And God's word contains wonders. And our life, you know, will be full of color and life when we can actually behold the wonders of the God's word. The psalmist said in the books of Psalm 119, verse 18, Psalm 119, verse 18, the Bible said, the psalmist said, He said, Open down my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. And we know the Bible is God's law. And when our eyes is open, we can see beyond the letters that are written. Because you see, the letter profited nothing. Sorry, this the 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 letter itself profited nothing. It's the spirit that gives it life. Now, this morning, I want to look at something that is very, very important, and that's the topic this morning. That the spirit, sorry, the word has spirit and life. The word has spirit and life. That's the topic for this morning. Every one of us understand the power of word, or we should understand the power of words. I've often said that one of the two most dangerous times. To be around people is actually when they're extremely angry or when they're extremely happy. I mean, notice you know the story of um, the man by the name of Jabesh in the books of First, um, First, First Chronicles chapter four, verse nine. The Bible says that because his mother bore him in pain, out of that reason he gave him a name that actually made the put a seal over his destiny. There's also a man by the name of um, um, Am from the books of Genesis chapter seven. His father, by the name of Noah, after he woke up from his slumber because he has been broadcasting that his father has been naked, the Bible said he placed a curse upon him that he will forever be a slave to his brothers. Now, the question is this. You might say, well, how can a mother, after carrying the baby for nine months, going through child labor to deliver the baby, and suddenly he, he, she began to curse the baby? It's because they were angry at that point in time. It's because they had an anger or they had something that's causing them to say something negative. That's why even when we are angry, we must learn to keep our voice quiet. We must learn to keep quiet. I might not say something that will affect our destiny. And another example I can give to you is when you are extremely happy, that's also a very dangerous time. And why do I say this? If you read the books of Genesis chapter 27, the Bible describes the incident or the story of Isaac wanting to bless his son Esau. But Jacob, uh, you know, through scheming with his mother, took the blessing instead. And the reason why Isaac had to delay on giving the blessing was the blessing could have come from his mouth, but not from his heart, not from his spirit man. How do I know this? That's why he said to him, he said, Esau, take your bow, take your quiver, go into the uh, into the forest, into the into the bush, and get and kill me a venison. Make that stew like I like, so that I might be able to eat it, and then my soul will bless you. It is not just his mouth; it's his soul that wants to bless. So sometimes the word that we speak might either be empty words or might they actually carry the force that will put them to work. And I'm praying that this month, as we begin to examine the wonders of God's word, that God's word will begin to work wonders in our lives. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Every one of us have been formed or we have been molded by words that somebody has spoken unto us. If you have ever passed through an educational institution like a school, the words of your teacher has formed you, has molded you the way you are. If you have ever grown old or grew up with your parents, the words of your parents, your guardian, whoever was responsible for you during your formative years has formed you and made you who you are. If you go to church regularly, the words of the pastor or the preacher or whoever is in charge has formed you the way you are. So words carry tremendous amount of power because the spirit behind the word is so key. And this is the mystery that we must understand. Now, the words I speak unto you, John chapter 6, verse 63, which is our base scripture for this morning, is that the words I speak unto you, they contain life and power. And I pray that the words of God will begin to work for us in every facet of our lives in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now can we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we want to thank you. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise, we give you adoration. There's no one like you, the ancients of days. Uh, the King of glory, the Lord of hosts. 
the mighty one in battle, the, the great I am. There's no one like you. No one can compare with you in heavens. Nobody can compare with you on earth, beneath the earth, in the sea. No one can compare with you. You're the almighty. You're the self-sufficient one. You're the one that has a beginning and ending in your hands. Everlasting Father, at this hour, we sit at your feet to learn your word. And to listen to what you have to say. We ask that our eyes of understanding be open. That you shall speak to us in a clear and direct manner. That your glory shall be seen upon us. Your goodness shall be seen upon us. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. I pray that the words that we shall hear shall fall upon the further ground in our hearts. And bring for good fruits in our life. To the glory and praise of your holy name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. One of the factors of life that distinguishes uh, humans from any other creature is the ability to alter words or make sound that is actually um, understood both in the physical and the spiritual world. I'm not saying animals don't make sound. They do make sound. Well, you know what I mean. We can communicate some words to each other that can either start a rebellion, start um, uh, and uh, give us encouragement, give us um, you know a passion to do something. We can motivate with words. Words alone has the power to to make the earth that we live in right now into a place that is um, completely uninhabitable. I mean, remember the words of Adolf Hitler during the Second World War. Out of a, out of his own personal thinking, he, be he believed that the Jews were responsible. For the evil that was happening in Germany and perhaps across the nations of the world, and then he decided to exterminate all of them. Now you 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 will say, how did he get that to happen? Well, all of a sudden he began to speak words, he began to spread his propaganda, and all of a sudden that evil began to ignite some anger and passion in the life of people, and suddenly people began to see it as the as the reality. The words that we speak carry tremendous power. Now, the Bible makes us understand something very peculiar in the books of Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. It says, where the word of a king is, there is power. Now, one thing I'm sure of is that God is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, so his word is superior to every other word. His word is superior to any other judgment. His word is superior to whoever on earth can call himself um, the, the most powerful man on earth, if I can use that word. God's word has never needed revision. Um, one of my spiritual fathers says is the oldest book with the, uh, the latest news. God's word has never been revised. There's no need, regardless of ant how antique you might think God's word is. His spirit has gathered the word and has given us in a format called the Bible, which is easily accessible. Think about it. The word of God is relevant to you wherever you live. Whatever continent you live on, people are getting transformed by reading the words of God in China. People are getting transformed by reading the word of God in Australia. People are getting uh, are getting transformed by reading the words of God in the United Kingdom here. People are getting transformed by reading the words of God even in Africa. So the words of God is universal. It brings unity to humanity and you must understand that until we ourselves understand the tremendous power of the words of God we will find ourselves constantly shortchanging ourselves in life. God's word carries creative forces that enables us to be able to determine the kind of future we want to live in. It was the words of God the Bible says in the books of Psalms 33 verse 6 by the words of the Lord the earth sorry the heavens were formed by the words of God. If that is the truth, that means that we can design the future or we can design the home or the place that we want to dwell by the words of God. Because that creative force of God is never limited to just during the, the days of the apostle. It's actually here and available to us, each and every one of us. The words of God contain life and spirit, not just empty words. I, I like to use this example. You see... If you have ever had an, any form of encounter with the, the military, the military, the military has the, an hierarchy system. The hierarchy system enables command, chain of command and uh, orders to flow from the top to the bottom. Now, if the general gives a command, it goes down to the colonel. Uh, the colonel might be in charge of a battalion or a group of men. 
because the order has come from the general, the colonel is bound to obey it. Now, if somebody who delivered the, the, the instruction was just a new recruit or just a lower rank officer to the colonel, and the colonel said, well, I'm not going to do that. But if the man now says, Sid, sir, the word came from above, then suddenly the colonel will say, well, I have to obey because the general has spoken. Now, the Bible makes us understand that Jehovah, the man of war, <laughs> that means he's above any colonel, any general, any field marshal, regardless of whatever ranking you are in the military, is the almighty. So his word carries unprecedented authority. That's why the books of Exodus chapter 8 verse 4 says, where the word of a king is, there is power. Whenever you hear the words of God being preached, be rest assured that the power of God is available for each and every one of us. Remember this. <laughs> the, the, the word became flesh and then he dwelt among us. Right? According to the books of John chapter 1. Now, Jesus was in a, in a house. He was teaching. The Pharisees, the Bible said the power of God was available for them to, to, to be healed. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, were more interested in arguing with Jesus about um, who, was, who was right, who is wrong, um, who, who, the words of God, um, the, Moses, law, precede any other instruction you want to give us. And therefore, we must obey Moses instead of you. But somebody said, well, I'm not interested in whether you're theoretically right. I'm not interested in whether you are, uh, you are the one that is right, um, the prophet or the priest. What I'm interested in is my, is my friend here to be healed. So they broke the roof and then they lowered the friend to Jesus. And Jesus said, son, thy sins are forgiven. Even got them even more angry. Now, wherever the words of God is being preached, the power of God is available to, to, to heal. That's why we understand from the books of Romans chapter 1 verse 16 that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the words of God. For is the power unto salvation, first unto the Jews, then unto the Greek. The words of God is available for you and I, and we can tap to the unlimited power of God's word. We can never exhaust God's word. God's word is inexhaustible. And I'm praying that in your life, your reservoir of resources will never run dry. Because God's word will never run dry in the precious name of Jesus Christ. God's word is eternal. It's forever. Oh Lord, thy word is settled. That means forever. Whether it is, um, uh, they said we are now in the, in the information age or the technological age. Maybe the next age that we will get into it will be the space age. Whatever age that we will get into, God's word is relevant. That's why I said it's an antique book that needs no revision. Now, I have said all of this. It's important that we look at why do we need the words of God in our lives? Why do we need the words of God in our life? Number one, you see, wherever we are right now, the spirit that behind the word that has been spoken unto us has shaped our future, has shaped who we are, has made us who we are. I'll give an example. I know somebody who was very personal to me, who during the formative years, she was told she won't be nothing. So she grew up feeling inadequate, no matter where she gets to, no matter what she does, she, has be, um, she managed to accomplish, she will always feel inadequate. Now, this is something I saw in crucial to you and I. We must understand that the words that we, that we hear have a spirit behind it. The spirit behind the word will determine what we will actually end up becoming. Now, if it's a force, that's why you see those in the occultic world would do certain incantation to invoke certain spirits. So when they speak a word, that word is backed up by a power, by some, by some power behind it. That power can be an evil power. Who will see that that word is affected in the life of people? The words I speak unto you, they contain life and they contain spirits. John chapter 6 verse 63. I'm praying that God will open our eyes beyond the words I'm speaking. They contain life and they contain spirit. Now, a body without no spirit is dead, and the body begins to decompose. 
So empty words will not have any effect. But when you speak words that carry a certain spirit behind it, it can either make or break you. So many of us have been broken down spiritually, mentally, emotionally by the words that people speak unto us. That's why without somebody lifting their hand to hit you, you begin to run tears in your eyes. When the stick can broke, don't break my one. Uh, words will never hurt me. That's a big lie. Sticks and bone do break your bones and words do hurt you and have great consequences or effect over your life. Without me hitting you, you can begin to cry by the words I speak. You know, a pastor, uh, many years ago, um, uh, some, was, some years ago, many years ago actually, somebody was sharing a story with me. There was this man of God who has the, the anointing to make you sleep. I mean, when you get into the church, even if you have taken, I don't know, um, Red Bull, caffeine to keep you awake. By the time you get to church and the man of God begins to preach, you will sleep off. That's how interesting a sermon is. But suddenly, <laughs> you know, he got elevated in the spiritual realm. He was given higher authority. Now, one day, the lady that was sharing the story with me, he said, my husband that is so used to sleeping off in church when this man is preaching. One day, he began to, the man began to preach. And suddenly, my husband was shedding tears. He looked at the husband. He looked at the altar. He looked at the husband. He looked at the altar. He said, can it be the same man preaching the word of God that we have often heard is preaching and my husband is crying. In other words, the spirit that actually backs up the new word, that the word that he's speaking is different. The spirit sometimes you will speak in a word to people and people will be motivated. Sometimes you speak some word to people and somebody want to commit jihad. It's the same word. So there's a spirit behind the word and every word that you've heard has made you or broken you. Number two, you cannot fight effectively spiritually without understanding the words and the power and the contents of the word you're speaking. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, it said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So you cannot wage a spiritual warfare. You've heard me say this countless times. Please do not pray or start a spiritual warfare without having a scriptural strategy that you want to use. A general that wants to go to war does not get up and say, man, let's go and fight. He'll be killed. I was listening to a story some, some years ago about some civil war that happened in Africa, actually in Nigeria. And they said that well, during the civil war, they called the Biafra War in the 60s or, or 70s, it was that suddenly the, the opposition side just carried his men and said, with sticks and stone, he said, go and fight. And they, the soldiers just began to shoot them at random. They were just for target practice. Why? Because they had no strategy, they had no focus, they had no ammunition to fight. If you're going to wage spiritual warfare successfully, you must have ammunition. And the ammunition that you need is actually the words of God. That's why the Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the ammunition that you need. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12. That is the ammunition you need. You cannot wage a successful spiritual warfare against the enemy without having uh, ammunition. Am I making sense to you? Number three, the works of God is the fabric that we need, or was one of the fabric that we need. God has corrected me about this in the past, so I always try to make the, um, this example. I was reading the books of Genesis some, some time ago when the Lord opened my eyes to see certain things. And oftentimes, you know, the scripture they, they does tell us that by the words of the Lord, the heaven and earth was formed. So my understanding was that the words of God was the only instrument needed to form the heaven and the earth. But suddenly he opened my eyes to see that in the books of Genesis, that's not the case. Because there was action required, even though there was speaking and forces working for him. The Bible says in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. It is a God spoke the heaven and the earth into existence. And as a result of that, you know, he began to separate light from darkness and so on and so forth. You know the story, Genesis chapter 1. 
So one of the key instrument to make your future, to form the future that you so desire, is that you need the words of God. I can't emphasize this enough. If you, the heaven and the earth and the glory of it, the vast beauty of it, I mean, if you travel across the nations of the world, you can see how wonderful, how beautiful, how glorious the earth is. You can only imagine what God has in stock for us when Jesus returned. Now, with all of that being said, that came about as a result of God's word. So, you need God's word in your life to beautify your life and to be the foundation to which you build. It said, a wise man builds his house upon a solid rock. The words of God are the solid rock that you can build upon. Because Jesus is a solid rock and he is the word of God. Remember, John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. I want us to understand this. It's so crucial for you and I to have a future that we, uh, we, we it, it is it is possible for you and I to have a future that we so desire, but that will come with a clear understanding of God's word. Many of us think the devil is um, is unintelligent. I've said it time and time again. The devil is many things but unwise or stupid. He has a reason why he will try to stop you and prevent you from reading the gospel or reading the Bible. You will have time for soap operas. You will have time for um, television series. You will have time for Netflix. You will have time to eat. You will have time to do anything. But you will find that you will, you will find out that there will always not be time. You will never have time to read the Bible. Because you shall know the truth. And the truth that you know shall make you free. You shall know the truth. John chapter 8 verse 32. You shall know the truth. See, the depth of the freedom that you are experiencing at this hour is a result of the depth of the knowledge of the word of God that you possess. If you don't possess in depth, you cannot build a skyscraper. Remember, we talked about earlier in the series that the foundation that we have determines the height that we can reach. Now, you shall know the truth. That means we need to constantly increase our depth of knowledge in the words of God to enable us to build higher and higher. I pray that you will see beyond the words I speak because your future is glorious and the devil wants to rob you whatever way. You see, nobody can make you feel inferior without your personal consent except in the days when you never knew your, le your left from your right. I mean, in this day and age, when practically a 14-year-old boy will tell you I'm old enough to be, I'm, I'm, I'm a man. So, nobody can make you feel inferior without your own personal consent. This is so important and crucial for you. I'm praying for you that God will open our eyes in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, having said all of this, let me begin to close the sermon. How do I encounter the spirit of the word of God? How do I begin to, you know, enjoy life and spirit that is that is embedded, that is that is uh, inside the word of God? Number one, obedience is the key. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Many of us might not know that. Partial obedience is still disobedience. You say, well, I obeyed a little. No, no, no. Partial ob dis uh, obedience is still disobedience. There's no, there's no mixing our words together here. Friends, we must understand that God expects absolute obedience. Absolute obedience to his word. Now, <laughs> some of us will rather discuss. Uh, I think I've shared this one before. Let me share it again for, for those who be, who've never heard me say it. I was speaking to a man some time ago, and he was um, he's one of those guys that I, don't, I would say antichrist or anti-scripture. He calls himself a Christian, but he doesn't go to church. He calls himself a Christian, but he never reads the Bible. He calls himself a Christian, but he does all kind of things the world still does. So my, my question then is sometimes, um, are you truly a Christian? But something happened the other day. We were actually we were talking, and he said something to me about the Bible not being complete. So I said, oh, okay. So I was thinking in my head, and the Spirit inspired me to something. And I said this to him. I said, um, if you had a friend that came to visit you, he said, yes. I said, suddenly the friend, you gave him food to eat. He said, yes. I said, after you give him food to the friend to eat, and, um, you know, he is not even taking a bite out of it, and then he began to ask you for more. 
He said, what would you say about the friend? I said, that, that man must be greedy. He said, what kind of a man comes to your house and you've not even eaten the food you've given him? He's asking you that you should bring more out. At least eat the one in front of you. I said, the Bible contains so much knowledge, so much depth, inexhaustible. He said, we have not even scratched the surface of the depth of God's knowledge in the Bible. So why are we then looking for some lost books? He was stunned when he looked at me. So when we sit down and we begin to dissect God's word, are we doing it because we want to increase knowledge? Or are we doing it because we are trying to bring it down and nullify the power of God's word? That's why Paul said, Romans chapter 1 verse 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel has power unto salvation. And I've told you, salvation is not just being born again. Because Philippians 2 verse 12 tells us clearly, he said, work out your salvation. And we know that none of us, our blood does not suffice uh, for redemption. So he can't be talking in that context as in redemption. He must be talking about something else. And as a result of that, we understand that when we are talking about salvation, for a man that is in bondage, salvation at that point in time will be, to set, will be set free. For a man that is going through financial difficulty, salvation will be, how can I prosper? For a man that is challenged in his health, salvation about that point in time will be healing. So salvation is relative to your situation, not to somebody else. So to understand this, First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, he said the kingdom of God is not in talks, but in demonstration of power. And the Bible makes me understand that the words that I speak unto you contain life and spirit. And whenever you see the word spirit, it means that the power of God is our work. How God and not Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. Where the Holy Ghost is, where the Spirit of God is, there is the power of God. So the words of God is the demonstration of God's power through His Word. I mean, using His Word for demonstration of God's power. We can use God's Word for demonstration of God's power. And we must use it effectively. Number two, the words of God is converted to power when you apply faith to it. Faith is what gives you power from the words of God. How do I know this? I think Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. It said, Unto us was the word preached, likewise unto them. But the word did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith. Unto us was the, the word preached, likewise unto them. Now, many people will hear my words today and they will take it and they will put it, put it away somewhere. They will never use it. And the challenges will come. They will be running health skelter. Health skelter. And they wonder to themselves, uh, this thing is not working. It's not that like it's not working. It's not because you, you, because you have not worked it. God's word works when you work it. So the words I speak unto you, uh, they are life and spirit. The words of God is, the, the, delivers God's power to you at the instance of your faith. The word of God delivers God's power unto you at the instance of your faith. You must, mix, you must mix the words of God with faith for it to be ignited and bring about the glory of God in your life. Number three, an encounter with the author. The word author um, is extended to mean authority. Now, the Bible makes us understand that all scriptures are given by the inspiration of God. All scripture are the breath of the Spirit of God. We understand that the Holy Spirit is the author behind the, the words of God from scriptures. Now, if that is the truth, if I write a book right now, I'll be the author. That means I have authority over that book. I can tell you what I meant in any context that you pick in the, within any, any of the chapters. I can explain to you the depths of it. I can pretty much tell you anything you want to hear from the book, about the book. Likewise, the, the, the Bible, because it's the Holy Spirit breath, uh, is, 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 the, is, the, is the words of God inspired by the Holy Spirit, it means that the Holy Spirit must be the person that gives us understanding of it. That's why John chapter 14 and John chapter 16 makes us understand that when the Comforter comes, the Holy Spirit, He will guide us into all truth. He will teach us to make us understand the Spirit behind the, the word that was spoken. When you encounter the Spirit behind the word that was spoken, which is the Holy Spirit, the words of God comes to life. They're just not mere letters. So when you see some people not having the same zeal as you do, 
when you hear the words of God is because they have not encountered the spirit behind the word. That's what gives you authority. That's what brings the reality of the words of God to you. That's what gives you the energy and the passion to say the words of God will perform wonders, will do what you said it would do. It will heal the sick. It will deliver those who are in captivity and so on and so forth. The words of God, they contain life and they contain spirit. Number four, use the words of God or the right word at the right time. I mean, let me, let me, let me, let me explain that. Don't turn up to a gunfight with a knife. Use the word. Well, I told us earlier that the words of God is the ammunition to fight. He said that the words of God are quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And for Hebrews 4 verse 12, it also makes us understand that uh, if you're going to fight the devil, you need a good weapon. Peace means that you have a stronger weapon than your enemy. Now, you might have a stronger weapon than your enemy, but if you don't know how to use it, then your enemy will still defeat you. That's why it's important that you understand the strategy and the tactics to use the words of God. There are different mysteries of the words of God. And the level you get to determines what mysteries are unveiled unto you. Now, using the words of God at the right time. I've seen people misquote the scripture. And people, I've seen people take scriptures out of, out of context. And I told people many times ago, I said, I can make the scripture say anything. For example, the Bible says that um, Moses served in the courts of Pharaoh. Does that mean that Moses was playing table tennis? No, he doesn't mean that. Or was playing long tennis. No, he doesn't mean that. Or uh, I can say what well, they said David, after he defeated, uh, defeated Goliath, he entered into the city triumphantly. Does that mean he was riding a motorcycle? No, we have a triumph motorcycle, yes. But it doesn't mean that David was riding one. What am I saying to you, friends, is this. Every one of us must understand that the scripture is for a particular season. That's why when you read the letters of Paul, they were addressing certain issues that were going on within the church. They were just not mere letters because he wanted to write them. For example, when he was writing the books of uh, the, uh, the current, uh, current church, and you read 1 Kings, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he talks about how can you be taking your cases to judges outside the church to judge? That's because there was a lot of dispute in the church. When he wrote to the books of Galatians, the church in, uh, in, the, in Galatians, he said to them, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He was addressing certain things. So you must not allow the context to be mistaken when you understand God's word. That's why I say use the right word in the right moment so that you can get the breakthrough that you so desire. Now, let me, be, let me begin to close. Is that you must use the word with authority. You might be speaking God's word, but because you don't have the faith, you don't have the authority to use it, you might be saying it quite uh, timidly or in a way that does not carry any force. One of the reasons I believe many people raise their voice when they are praying and shouting is because they want to speak with authority and power. But when you understand who you are and know who you are, I've often looked at the life of Jesus and I see that he didn't need that to shout to raise the dead. He didn't need to shout to heal the sick. He didn't need to shout to cleanse the leper. So what we must understand is that what are we doing when it comes to the word of God? Are we simply not using it with enough authority? Because if you don't have authority to use the word of God and you begin to use it, then you'll be caught foul. Because truly, the devil knows who truly are God's people. He said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. He said, who are you? May he count you among the numbers of those that, recognize, that he recognizes in the spiritual realm. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Let me close finally, finally. Two things I want to say. The words that we speak have life and they contain power. Every one of us must have that understanding. Everything around us have an ear and they listen. So whenever you're speaking, be rest assured. If the devil wants to entrap you, he will, he will look for you at the time when you are insensitive, speaking casually, without any thinking or any thoughts behind it. And he will say, by the words of your mouth, would you be condemned? By the words of your mouth, would you be delivered? Matthew chapter 12, 36 and 37. And he will entrap you using your word. May that not be your portion in the precious name of Jesus Christ. I want to close by saying, use the words of God. They are the most potent, most freely available weapon that you have. 
against the enemy. Yes, we all have different ranks when it comes to spiritual hierarchy. But each and every one of us have the same authority when it comes to God's word. Because where the word of the king is, there is power. May the power of God be available to you through his word in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now shall we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we want to thank you for your word. This morning, we give you glory and praise. We honor your holy name. Thank you for speaking to us in a way that is clear and precise and direct. Father, we bless you because we know that of a truth, your word is here and amen. Everlasting Father, I pray that each and every one of us will encounter that spirit of God that is behind the words of God. That each, of our, each and every one of us will begin to see the reality of the scriptures in our lives. We begin to ex ex experience supernatural breakthrough, healing, transformation of life, change of story in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And I pray, my Lord and my God, that every one of us this week shall have a great testimony. We will not end this week empty-handed. But your blessings that make it rich and add no sorrow shall be our portion. We shall encounter the goodwill of men and women wherever we go. People go out of their way to favor us, to see us comfortable in the precious name of Jesus Christ. The words that we have heard will not stand against us on judgment day. But it shall be for our glorification in life, in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday for the prayer meet, uh, for the uh, midweek service. And I believe that you shall be blessed in Jesus' precious name. Good day. Bye-bye.